doing God's will. Every week in tens of thousands of churches around the world, people pray the Lord's Prayer. Now, I know that we don't often pray the Lord's Prayer, uh, but it's something that, that comes from our heart. It, it, it's not a matter of repeating certain words or certain phrases, but it's a, it's a lifestyle. And if you remember the Lord's Prayer, it's, it goes something like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Have you ever thought about that? Just to paraphrase that a little bit, the, the Lord's Prayer starts out with addressing God as our heavenly Father. And then it goes on to say, I want to praise you, which we were just doing. And it says, may your kingdom come. A kingdom is something where there is a king and there's rules and regulations and there's subjects to the kingdom. And we're in that Lord's Prayer, we say, Lord, may your kingdom come here and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, God has a will in heaven. God has a plan in heaven. God has certain things that he would like in heaven, but we pray that it would be done here on earth. In other words, this is something that's part of our responsibility to allow Jesus Christ to be the king of his kingdom in our home, in our family, at our work, at our school, to say, Lord Jesus, you are going to be the Lord. You are going to be the king. I'm going to let you rule and let you reign in this area of my life. And we say, and your will be done. Have you ever thought about that? What is the Lord's will? What is the Lord's will for this church? What is the Lord's will for your life? Have you ever asked him, Lord Jesus, what is your will for my life? What is your will for my family? What is your will for my children? What is your will for the place where I go to school or the place where I work? Can you know God's will? Yes, I think we can know God's will. In Psalms, you have it uh, written here on your papers. You can take a look. In Psalms 143, verse 10, the psalmist says, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. The psalmist here is saying, teach me. I don't know what it is, but I want you to teach me. What is your will for my life? Help me stop thinking just about myself. Stop to thinking about just my needs. And start thinking about, God, what is your will? What is your plan? What is your needs? Teach me. Lead me. What do you want in my life? In Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Think about that for a moment. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, Jesus, Jesus is going to enter heaven, but only those that do his will. That sort of, you know, goes against our thinking. It, we, 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 we try to think that if I just say that Jesus is my Lord, you know, that takes care of everything. And 
But here it says, it's not enough just to say, Lord, Lord. You have to start doing his will. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 50, it says, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. It's not just a matter of claiming that we are children of God or, or going to church from time to time or putting on a good show for other people, but it's a matter of finding out what God wants for us and start doing it in our life. You know, I learned a long time ago that we can do many good things for God that were never his will. For example, God, I would like to do this and this and this for you because you know, people will look at me, people will say how great a voice I have or how wonderful a teacher I am or you know, a hundred other different reasons. We can be doing lots of things for God without it being God's will. We can be so busy working for God that we never take the time to ask God, what would you like me to do? We say, God, I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this for you, so please come and bless me. You know, I, I learned a lesson about 20 years ago, uh, the very hard way of doing something for God and then saying, God, I need you now to come and bless me. And the Lord said to me, I always bless you what my will is, but if it's your will, you need to ask for the blessing. If it's my will, I automatically bless. If it's my will, I pay the bills. If it's my will, I provide for all the needs. But if it's your will, you need to pay for the bills. <laughs> and you need to provide for everything. And I learned Lord Jesus, I want to stop doing what is my will and asking your blessing upon it. And I want to start doing your will because you automatically bless what is yours. I think that sometimes people think that just by attending church time to time or, or maybe even every week, that this is all that God wants from me. This is what God's will is for me just to show up at church from time to time, and, and that's, that's, all. that's all, that's all that's required. I'll think about God on, on Sunday morning, but the rest of the, of the week, it's, it's just for myself to do the things that I want to do. I think that God requires a lot more, and I think there's a lot more that God has for us. But if I start praying, God, what is your will for me? Maybe God will tell me to do something that I don't want to do. Have you ever worried about that? Come on, let's be honest. Be honest. If I ever prayed, God, show me what your will, I'm afraid that he'll tell me to do something that I don't want to do. Well, I prayed such a prayer back when I was about 22 years old, I had no desire to come to Poland. I didn't even know where Poland was on the map of Europe. It wasn't part of my plan, it wasn't part of my will, but it was part of God's plan and part of God's will. You might say, but if I say, God, I want to do your will, Maybe he'll ask me something that I don't have any experience in. Or maybe I don't have any knowledge about. Or maybe I don't have the skills. Maybe I don't have the gifts to do it. Or maybe I'm too shy or I'm too embarrassed. Or I don't have enough money. 
or it's not part of my character. You know, some people are outgoing. I'm, I'm, I'm just an introvert. I'm, I just, you know, that's what I used to be. In the church where I grew up, I used to sit in the very back corner, hoping that nobody would see me. I was a very shy person. I would never think of making friends, having relationships, standing in front of other people. I was just hoping nobody would notice me in church. But God had other plans. You might say, but God, I don't feel qualified. If you ask me to do something, I don't feel qualified to do it. You know, every person that God called in the Bible had their excuses. They didn't feel gifted. They didn't feel qualified. They didn't feel that they were the right person for the job. When God called Gideon, he was down in the wine press, hiding from the Midianites. And the angel came over and he looked down the hole and he said, mighty warrior and he was looking up no there's no mighty warriors down in this hole there's only mighty cowards in this hole he didn't feel qualified he didn't feel it was part of his character but God sees something that we don't see yet God will not leave us on our own to fulfill his will if he has a will for you he also has the tools for you he also has the finances for you. He has the gifts. He has the people to come alongside you. He will never leave you alone to figure it out on your own. And not only that, he is also giving us an example, a pattern to follow. And that pattern, that example to follow is Jesus Christ. Let's take a look at John chapter 6, verse 38. It says this, Jesus says this, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus is our example. And if you're not sure what to do, what to say, just look to Jesus and think, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? How would he act? Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 34, it says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. It was doing the Father's will that gave Jesus his strength, gave Jesus his power, gave Jesus all that he needed in his life. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 to 7, it says, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God that it is written in me in the scroll of the book. See, in the Old Testament times, whenever a person sinned, there was the requirement to give a sin offering, uh, an animal that had no blemish. And the person who was offering was required to kill that animal himself and to place it on the altar. He was able to see the consequences of his sin because his hands were covered in blood from killing the animal himself. But that sacrifice, it only lasted, it only covered up the sin and only gave forgiveness for the sin until he sinned again, which could be within the hour, later that day, the next day. And then he would have to offer another sacrifice and another sacrifice. He was 
able to look at the consequences of his actions by seeing the blood on his hands. And God was hoping by, that by seeing the blood on your hands, you'd see the, the terrible consequences of sin and the taking of an innocent life to cover over those sins. Going back to this verse, Jesus says, you didn't really have desire for sacrifices and offerings. That's not something that, that God really desired. What he really desired was that we would give our bodies and our lives to him. And he says, I have come to do your will. God doesn't want some sacrifice from us. God doesn't want a slain animal. What he does want is he wants obedience. What he does want is he wants our hearts. He wants our lives. He wants to look down and say, she belongs to me. She'll do whatever I ask her to do. He belongs to me. He'll do whatever I ask him to do. He doesn't want sacrifices. He wants you. And this also includes our bodies like it included Jesus' body. It includes our will. It includes our plans. It includes our future. He wants it all. He gave everything that he had for us. And so in return, he expects that we would give everything that we have for him. He loved you enough to die for you. Do you love him enough to live for him? I heard the once a story about a, a man in China who went swimming in a lake and he started to drown. And as he was there in the water drowning, he started calling out for help. And there just happened to be another man on the shore of the lake who heard the, the calling of, of the man who was drowning. Now, I don't know if you've had any experience or if you've heard on the news or other sources that very often the person who goes and swims out and tries to rescue a person who is drowning, they usually end up drowning. Why is that? Because the person who is there in the water panicking grabs onto this person and pulls them down to stay up. And very often someone who, who tries to rescue someone sacrifices his life. And so this man swims out to him and grabs him from behind, because that's what you sh should do if you're rescuing a person who's drowning, get them from behind so they don't push you underneath the water. And he pulled them to the shore and he saved him. And the man who was saved said, I'm so glad that you offered your life to save me. And so, if you had not done that, I would have died in that lake. From today, I live because of you. And because of you, my old life is gone. I now have a new life. And because of what you did, I will no longer live for myself, but I will willingly become your servant and go wherever you go and do whatever you ask me to do. Because if it was not for you, I would be dead. It sounds a lot like the story of Jesus and us, that he gave his life for us. And what he asks in return is that we would make him our Lord. And that we would have the attitude of saying, if it was not for you, I would be dead, dead in my sins, separated forever. And so from today, I want to live for you. I will no longer live for myself. I want to live for you. Can you say that? Have you ever said that to Jesus? 
We saw earlier in the verses in Hebrew that God gave Jesus a body in order to submit to the Father's will. God also gave us a body. What should we do with that body? Let it enjoy itself and do whatever it wants? It says God wasn't pleased with offerings because they were temporary. But Jesus received a body in order to go to the cross and pay for our sins once and for all. That's why we no longer offer animal sacrifices because Jesus' perfect life and death and resurrection on the cross. We're no longer separated from God. We, are, we can be re reunited with God. Jesus chose to do the Father's will, although it wasn't easy for him. When the Father showed the plan that he has to die on the cross, it didn't give Jesus warm, fuzzy feelings in his heart. <laughs> I'm sure he thought about it that, oh, this isn't going to be nice. It's not going to be pleasant. But because I love them so much, I'm going to do it. In Matthew verse, uh, chapter 26, verse 39 says, and going a little further, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus chose to do God's will. Not always God's will will be pleasant in your life, but it will always be eternally rewarded. We won't find in the Bible what is God's will for where I work, where I'll live, who I'll marry, but we will find some verses generally about how we should live. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 3 and 4 says this, for this is the will of God your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor. What is God's will for you? That you would be sexually pure. Sometimes I meet with young guys who are dating or thinking about dating and they asked me, you know, how far can I go with a girl and for it not to be sin yet? That's the wrong question. The right question is, how close can I get to pleasing God? See, guys and girls, because I know there's lots of young people here who are not married, and this also applies to those who are married. You don't know if this boyfriend, this girlfriend, this, this girl, this guy, if she'll be your husband, wife, or somebody else's husband and wife. Would you want somebody else doing with them what you would like to do with them, with your husband and wife? No, you wouldn't, because you're jealous, yeah? There should be a certain relationship between a husband and wife, and, and it should be holy, and it should be protected. If we wouldn't want someone else doing it with our husband or wife, then we shouldn't think about doing it with somebody who's a boyfriend or a girlfriend. When I grew up, in a church, I was attending a youth group and I had a, a wonderful uh, youth pastors, George and Leslie Middleton. In fact, I was preaching in their church last week and they're probably watching today, so hello, glad to see you. I was preaching online last week. And he said this to our young guys and it's, it's always stuck with me, it's always stuck in my head and it's always stuck in my heart. He said, the best gift 
that you can give to your future husband or wife is the gift of purity. To say to them, I kept myself for you. That's the most wonderful gift you can give to a future husband or wife. Now, what happens if I've already sinned? Well, then you just need to confess it, repent of it, and from today say, I'm going to stay pure. I am going to stay holy. I am not going to go back to those old ways. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 and 18 says this. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So we see something else. So we saw God's will is for you to be holy and pure sexually. God's will is for you to pray continually, not complain continually, pray continually, to rejoice, to give thanks in all circumstances. We don't thank God for the bad things that happen, but in those bad things that happen, we thank God. I told the story uh, some time ago in this church that I was in Switzerland, I was riding on a motorcycle, and suddenly somebody walked out on the street in front of me, and I had a swerve, and as I swerved, the, the motorcycle went down and started dragging me down the street. And as it is dragging me down the street, it's crushing my left leg. Uh, I'm looking back behind me, and there are cars coming straight at me. And as I'm being dragged down the street, because my hand is still on the throttle, because it had been an attitude of my heart, I started thanking God. Thank you, God, that the car behind me hasn't run over my head yet. Thank you, God, that it doesn't hurt yet. Thank you, God, that I'm still alive and as I'm being dragged down the street. And then it finally comes to a stop. My left leg is, is crushed, my, my knee is damaged. Uh, an ambulance comes and takes me to the hospital and they put me on this gurney and they, they wheel me into the, the hallway of the hospital and they're, I'm waiting to get uh, x-rays. And as I'm laying there on the bed in the hallway, and doctors and patients are walking back and forth. I raise my hands up to God and I start singing worship songs. I start thanking God. Thank you, God, that it's not worse than it is. Thank you, God, that I'm still alive. Thank you, God, that it's just a damaged motorcycle. Thank you, God, that my right leg isn't injured. <laughs> And as I am laying there and I'm singing out loud and I am raising my hands on this bed, worshiping God, I believe that in the circumstances, not because of the circumstances, but in the circumstances, God was pleased. And he came down and he touched me and he healed me. And I got the x-rays and the x-rays showed that there is nothing wrong. Although 30 minutes earlier, I couldn't walk. And my clothes were all torn. I was bleeding everywhere and I walked five kilometers home, praising God. Because when we pray continually, when we thank continually, when we worship continually, God can do something incredible in our lives. <coughs> First Peter chapter 2, verse 15 says, For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put silence the ignorance of foolish people. So God's will is for you to be holy. God's will is for you to pray. God's will is for you to rejoice. God's will is for you to give thanks. And God's will is for you to do good. And do good to the people that don't deserve it. It's easy to do good to somebody who's doing good to us. 
it's much harder to do good to people at school who are ridiculing us, people that work who are criticizing us, people who treat us badly. And when we do good, it's a testimony to God. And it's a testimony to them. And God can work in those circumstances, in those situations, and that by doing good, we can turn our enemies into our friends even. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says this, also in regards to God's will. It is God who desires for all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Should you ever ask God, should I share the gospel with this person? Yes, it's God's will. God wants everybody to be saved. God wants your family to be saved, your neighbors to be saved, your coworkers to be saved, your enemies to be saved. Should I ask them for prayer when they're sick? Should I pray for them when they're discouraged, when they're sad? Yes, because when you do, God has the opportunity to work through you. And even if you don't share the entire gospel story with them, if you don't share the four spiritual laws and, and the whole story about the cross and the resurrection, God can still use that one or two words that you say, like seeds planting in, in fertile ground that one day they will take roots and they will bloom and they will give fruit. Just sharing that God loves them, sharing that we want to pray for them, be a help for them, be a blessing for them. Well, you need to not only pray and ask God what his will is, but you also need to be willing to do it. It's not enough to say, God, what is your will? And when he tells us to say no. God wants you to know what his will is even more than you want to know. And when he reveals his will to us, we need to be ready to do it. There's no sense asking if you won't obey. God, what is your will? I would like you to be a missionary. Oh, no, 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 God, I'm not going to be a missionary. God, what is your will? I would like for you to quit your job and wait on me. I will give you instructions. Oh, no, I'm not going to quit my job. That's, that's foolish. God, what is your will? I want you to give your car to this person. Oh, no, that's my car. I'm not going to give it. <laughs> God, what is your will? I want you to sell all your possessions and wait for the next step. Oh, no, no, God, that's too hard. I'm not going to do that. Don't ask what God's will is if you're not willing to obey. Now, those are some of the big things. God may not ask you for some of those big things. He might ask you for something smaller, like I want you to go to the person who hurt you the most in life and forgive them and bless them and do something nice for them. Are you ready to do it? I want you to go to this person who has mocked you all the time for being a Christian and share the gospel with them. Are you willing to do it? Are you willing to do whatever he asks you to do? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36 says this. For you have a need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what is promised. Now, I don't know what, what God has promised. For each person, it might be something different. It might be something Material, it might be something physical. 
It might be something right here on earth. It will probably be something in heaven. But there are certain rewards that we will receive when we are obedient to God's will here on earth, such as the joy of seeing someone give their life to Christ and become a Christian. Oh, there is no greater joy than to see someone who turns his life around and submits it to God. The joy of knowing that you help somebody that no one else would help. The feeling of satisfaction that you did the right thing. Those are some of the rewards that God has for you. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2 says this. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And just as Jesus received a body, we also received a body. And those bodies are to be used to please God. And here it says we should give our bodies to God as living sacrifices. But that's not all. It says that we need to stop acting like the sinners act. And we start, need to start renewing and refreshing and changing our minds, transforming our minds. We need to start thinking the way that God thinks. We need to start seeing the things that God sees. We need to start doing the things that Jesus would do. We need to get the bigger picture and not just look at the small and the temporary that is here today. We need to act like Jesus acted. He looked beyond what was happening at the moment when he was being accused, when he was being beaten and tortured. He looked beyond the physical and the temporal and the things of the moment, he looked much further to you and to me. He presented his body to God as a sacrifice for sins. Now, we can't offer our body as a sacrifice for sins because Jesus has done it once and it's been done once and for all. But we can still offer our bodies and say, God, here's my body, take it, use it, I want you to be pleased with the way that I live, with the way I behave, with what I do. When I was 23 years old, I prayed a radical prayer. And I prayed this. I said, God, I will go anywhere that you want me to go. God, I will do anything that you want me to do. And God, I will say anything that you want me to say. My answer to you will always be, yes, Lord. I have met some Christians in my life that when God speaks to them, they say, no, Lord. God asks them to do something and they say, no, Lord. You know, when you say, no, Lord, what you're actually saying is this. No, you are not my Lord. I am my Lord. You are not my Lord. If you really have given your life to Christ, then your reply, every time he speaks to you, it needs to be, Yes, Lord. Yes, you are my Lord. Yes, you are my Savior. Yes, you have the right to demand from me. You have the right to speak to me. And I will do what you want me to do. If the Lord speaks to you, don't say no, Lord. Say yes, Lord. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 17, it says... Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, 
making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Understand what is God's will for you? What is his plans for you? It might be the same things that you're doing right now because he puts his desires in our hearts. But it might be something also different. So we need to check our hearts. Is it God's will or is it our plans? Do you ever ask God, do you get up in the morning when you pray and you say, God, what would you have me do today? Maybe you won't hear him audibly, physically. But if you are praying such things, and if you're open to hearing his voice, I'm sure that he is able to arrange something that's outside of your normal routine. I'm sure that he's able to use you. If you say, God, here I am, use me today. What would you like me to do today? As you're going about your daily life, something will happen, and you'll think, ah, oh, that's the opportunity God is giving me today to do something for him, to fulfill his will. An opportunity arises, and you act, and then that joy comes into your life because you know that you did what God asked you to do that day. If you ask the Lord, he can make his will known to you through that quiet voice of the Holy Spirit living inside you, through spiritual gifts, through biblical teaching, through counseling, through godly wisdom, through circumstances and, and dozens of other ways. But you have to desire. If you really want to do your, his will, if it's your number one priority and you do something and it turns out, you know, many people come to me, what happens if I think it's God's will and I do it and it's not God's will? You know, what will happen then if I, I make a mistake? Well, that's something you don't need to worry about because if your heart is really in the right place and you really desire to serve God, even if you hear him wrong, if you, instead of going the straight path, you take a left or you take a right, God is able to put you back onto that path. Even if you strayed a little bit, but your desire is to serve him, he will make your path straight. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So don't worry about maybe getting it wrong. What's more important is the willingness to be obedient. And even if you get it wrong a little bit, he'll get you back on track. You don't need to worry about that. Because if we have good intentions, he will honor those and make sure that we continue on the path that he has for us. So I'm going to ask the, the worship team to come up here. And I'm going to have a couple things, some questions I'd just like you to, to think about. We're going to go in time, into a time of worship, a time of prayer. If you have never given your life to God, yeah, maybe you come to church time to time or maybe even every week, but you've never given your life to God. Today is the day to do it. So when we pray, I'm going to ask you to come forward and I'm going to be up here in the front and Pastor Clint and if more people are needed, we're going to ask other leaders to come forward and we're going to pray for you. That that decision would be supported by our prayers and encouraged by our prayers. If you today, if you're single, I'd like for you to make a commitment 
that I am going to keep myself pure until I get married. And when I'm married, I'm going to stay pure. And if you've already made a mistake, confess it, repent of it, and say, from today on, my life is going to be sexually pure. I'd like for you to make a radical commitment right now that whatever is God is asking you to do, that you're going to do it. No more excuses. Some of you already know what God is asking you to do. You just need to start doing it. And others, maybe you don't know what God wants you to do, and, and today's the day for you to start asking. So I'm going to ask you also to come forward so we can pray for you. I told you that there was this prayer that I prayed. And I've even sung it to the Lord many times. And I'm going to sing it for you. And as we're singing, and we're going to go into another worship song. We're, I'm going to ask you to come forward. We're going to pray for you. And I've sung this prayer, and I like, I'd love for you to sing it also with me. I will go anywhere that you want me to go. Yes, Lord. And I'll do anything that you want me to do. Yes, Lord. And I'll say anything that you want me to say. Yes, Lord. I will go anywhere that you want me to go. Yes, Lord. I'll do anything that you want me to do. Yes, Lord. And I'll say anything that you want me to say. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So we're going to continue to work. I'm going to encourage you to come forward and to, to pray and to make your life right with God today.